Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe and do consider supporting the channel via PayPal or Patreon. You'll find the links in the video description. Round 10 of the Tata Steel Tournament and I'm looking at the game between the two Indian players Vidic Gujarati and Ramesh Babu Prakinananda. So going into this round, Prag had lost three games in a row. He did have very strong opponents, Carlson Mamadyorov and Karyakin, but difficult to pick yourself up after those defeats. Vidit, well, he'd lost a little bit of pace with the leaders, uh, but if he could win this game, that would take him right back within reach of first place. So Vidit, no doubt, looking to play for a win. And of course, there's a little bit of rivalry between the two Indian players. And some, maybe some pressure on Vidit. You know, the 27-year-old against the 16-year-old. So it's this trendy variation of the Nimzu Indian. I say trendy. Queen C2 has been played for, you know, since the 1940s, 1950s. Uh, it remains, uh, well, very current and ho hotly debated. And this line, this exact line, was played by Prague earlier in the tournament against Rapport. Uh, if you remember, Rapport won a really nice game against Prague. And in that game, he played Queen G3 um, and outplayed Prague in Ananda. Here, Vidit played the more normal move, Queen F3, so looking to damage the pawns, so therefore Knight D7 and E3. But, you know, I'm sure this is basically what um, Vidit wanted from this game. He's got a really sharp position on the board. So he's a pawn up, rook comes into the middle, uh, but of course the king is a little bit exposed on the queen side. And in fact, I'm sure both players knew that they were following a previous game between uh, Magnus Carlsen and Levon Aronian. And here Aronian played bishop g4, and well, it was really double-edged position that Carlsen eventually won. But instead of that, Prague played pawn to d3. Uh, I'm sure this was uh, a little bit of homework. And then after bishop g4, rook takes d3. And yeah, it's possible to... Uh, here Prague played queen a5. It's possible to take the queen. And this is an exchange sacrifice. White has... Two pawns and a bishop for the rook. Double-edged position. It's, it's, it's playable for black. Um, but yeah, interesting compensation with you know these, these really nice queenside pawns. But instead, Prague played queen a5. Queen's attacked, so the queen stepped to the side and queen takes c5. So black is a pawn down, but obviously has compensation in that... His rooks are already connected, white is lagging in development, and the king, as before, is a little bit drafty there on the queen side. Rook d2 defends the extra pawn, but black obviously has compensation here, so, you know, it's, it's a very interesting position. Threat to take here, and now, well, if white wants to hang on to this pawn, then this move is necessary. b4. But it's such a double-edged decision to play b4 because the king is even more exposed now. But yeah, this is interesting. Queen takes e5, a really cold-blooded decision. So this does bring the queen back into play. Bishop takes c4 and king b2. So white is still a pawn up. But... Yeah, not so easy with the pawns here, uh, with the king behind it. So can black try to create some trouble on the queen side? Well, a5 is a good start, trying to open up lines. So naturally, white has to close the position down. And, and in fact, Vidit thought for around 25 minutes over that move. So he's obviously starting to have a few qualms about this position. It's certainly not easy for white to play. Um, bishop takes bishop and queen c4. 
hitting the rook, which came to c1, and now a4. Scary. But knight b1 defends the pawn so that after the check, the king can drop back to a1, and, well, the king is sort of secure. At least Vidit has managed to bring all his rooks into play, and the queen is very actively placed here. But that pawn is a little bit out on the limb, and it's it's only, let me see, it's only one pawn advantage. But let's have a look. Rook c8. Yep, has to get the has to get the rooks into play. And that looks pretty nice on an open file. Queen f5. So Prague obviously has compensation here. It's it's just a really difficult position. I think it's certainly more difficult for, for white to play than black. You know, black kind of lurks and just try to tries to hit weaknesses in, in the position. Uh, queen c1 is interesting here, but Prague played queen c7. Hitting that pawn down there. g3. b6. Okay, that's an interesting move, actually. Um, Prague offers a second pawn. But here's the idea. Knight d7. So Prague is now two pawns down, but with that knight switching over to c5 and looking through here, well, that's obvious compensation. It's possible, in fact, that instead of taking the pawn, queen d3 might have been a canny move to, to stop that knight coming over. But in any case, white is still okay here, but it's just getting trickier. Rook e4 played. Um... Yeah, I mean, it, it's really hard to say what the best move is, but rook d4 <clears throat> is is uh, maybe on a more stable square, but anyway, rook e4 played. Looking perhaps to come down here at some point. g6, queen f4. Of course, an exchange of queens would be highly desirable for white. Queen c5. And here, perhaps rook b4 to defend that pawn instead. Well, Vidit goes for the very tempting move. Queen takes h6. You know, perhaps he can get some attack against the king. It's possible. But queen b5 is a good move. So the knight would like to fly into the position. And if rook h4, that's, of course, what you want to play uh, with checkmate. But queen e5 check is crushing. So now it's getting really difficult for white. And <clears throat> to add to the fun, uh, both players were in time pressure. <clears throat> A4. Queen c6 hits the rook. Queen f4 and now knight c5. Rook c4. So white is still two pawns up. Nevertheless, this is uh, a really very difficult position to play. I should mention that if knight b3 check, then the king steps up and this position might well be good for white, actually, with two pawns and, well, the possibility to attack that pawn actually quite quickly and the king can join in as well but this is a very important moment in the game here Prague played rook d8 and it's not the best move he could have played rook a8 just starting an attack on the a file um, and if king b2 b5 anyway and once the position opens, then the king will be cut to shreds. That's really strong. So rook d8 is a mistake. Nevertheless, still a very, very difficult position for white to play. Um, the engines indicate that rook b4 is the best move here. It's certainly not an obvious move, and certainly not obvious why that's a good move. Rook c2 played instead. Again, rook a8 is probably a good move, but queen h1, well, that's also a very tricky move, actually. I think a good practical move. 
with with a couple of ideas, possibly rook d1, but we're going to see uh, another idea. After queen b4, that's the move played, knight takes pawn. This was Prague's idea. So obviously if queen takes, then rook a8. There you go. Rook is supported by the queen. Well, the, the arrow should go the other way around, of course. Um, so now, again, the game has really kind of turned. Rook c8. And Vidit is under massive pressure now that his king is exposed. Queen a8. So that's an important move, preventing rook d8 check. And of course, in the same line as the king. Rook a2, b5. So that, uh, I'm sure Prague must have been very relieved to play that move because that just kind of binds everything together and gives his queen and rook more freedom after that. So they've reached the time control. And, well, you know, it's easier to sort of take stock when you're when you're playing black now. Queen h1 again, this queen flashing back and forth. Rook a3, and well, Prague simply took the pawn on h2. It's it's not a bad move. Um, if queen b5, you can see this is a very hard-working queen. Queen h8. I love the way it just bounces around the angles, just like on a snooker table. Um, and yeah, king a2, rook c2 check is a decisive attack. So queen d2. So now material is level and black still has an initiative. That king is still exposed. So it's, it's now looking very promising for black. Check, queen d4. And that, queen e7. So Prague is still probing, trying to get... An attack on the king. And here, well, b4 is a tempting move, uh, but Prague went rook d8. Just wants to get the queen off the long diagonal, and then a check on f6 will be decisive. You can see these squares are covered, so the queen is lacking options. So queen e5 is forced, or near as damn it anyway. And here Prague could have played on with... played. I say played on, played for the attack with queen b4. But instead he made a very pragma pragmatic decision. There was no pun intended. <laughs> there you go, Prag is pragmatic. Um, by exchanging queens and just playing for this endgame, you know, he wants certainty. And it's obvious that he is better here. Uh, white has no hope of winning. Why? Basically only two results are possible. It's either going to be a win for Prague and Ananda or a draw. Um, and that's tough to play for White. So, yeah, as I said, it's it's a pragmatic decision uh, from Prague. It's kind of easier to play than, you know, trying to break down White's defences. You know, he tried that already. I mean, under normal circumstances, this should be a really easy win for Black because he's a pawn up and these pawns are split. And crucially, this king is miles away. The problem is that after knight a3, this pawn is going to drop. Nevertheless, there are ways to play on and obviously these pawns are going to be targeted now. Um, knight c5 played, rook takes b5, rook takes e3. Black still a pawn up. Uh, rook takes knight, rook takes knight check, followed by rook takes pawn, completely winning for black. So knight c4, rook e1 check, and knight e4. So the king across the other side of the board should be over here on g2 or something, but this is unpleasant with this isolated pawn. Rook e2, king c1, and here just maintaining... The rook on the seventh with rook f2 looks like a good move, but Prague played knight f2. And now it gets a little bit tricky again, actually. Still, it's very, very unpleasant for white to try to defend this position. You know, black can go around in circles a hundred times. 
And now, uh, Vidit played king b2, which I didn't quite understand. I think knight f3 looks like a better move just to, to guard the g-pawn. Um, but anyway, king b2 played instead. And rook c8 looks like a really nice move just to cut the king off. Rook d5, knight d1 check, and knight e3. And rook d3. And here, well, Prague seized his chance to exchange knights. I mean, I don't think Vidic should have allowed this, really. Uh, by this stage, well, it's impossible to, to stop because rook d4 allows knight c2. But, yeah, I think he could have defended better. Uh, but now, again, there's kind of clarity. And this should be winning with the king so far cut off. So black basically has two ideas. You can either try and round up that g-pawn or, well, with due care, you create a pass pawn and with the king so far away should be possible to shepherd this pawn home. Uh, so, for example, yeah, rook g2. If rook g2, then f6. Now, yeah, it's a bit tricky if the king comes forward, actually, but king g7 is possible with the idea g5 and after rook g2. Rook c7, here's the technique. And now the king comes up. And this is the point. You don't bring the king back, but you play rook g7 to guard the pawn, and now g5 g4 and this is winning and if, if the rook checks now then it can the king just marches towards the rook so the king is too far away that's winning for black so that's I mean one typical scenario uh, rook a2 played so that means if the f-pawn advances then there's going to be a check here so now Prague just uh, hangs around for a little bit I think he was just gaining time on the clock but there's you know, in this position, there's no need to rush it. I think he was absolutely right in sorting out his strategy first, gaining a little bit of time. And finally, he brings the king up. And it comes up. I mean, basically, this, this rook is going to have to duck back at some moment because this rook can attack the pawn. King e6, rook e5, rook a5, rook f1. So here's the idea. Rook f5, threatening to exchange rooks, and then you take the pawn. And that's roughly what happens in the game. I mean, white, by this point, has absolutely no defense. And after this, Vidit resigned. Rook f5 is the threat, and that is game over. Let me just show that. So here, rook f5, exchanging rooks is hopeless, second pawn drops, um, you could even take with the pawn, and of course if the rook moves away then king takes pawn, two connected pass pawns, really easy win. So that is quite a win for Praginananda, defeating his compatriot uh, Vidit, who well understandably didn't look too pleased after the game, um, but well I'm delighted for Praginananda, who's you know, had a difficult time over the last three games, but this one brings him back to uh, some kind of respectability. It's difficult for him. He's um, rated the lowest in the tournament with 26-12. Still an amazing rating for a 16-year-old. Uh, but that brings uh, Prague to 3.5 out of 10. He's scored a couple of wins so far. He's beaten Nils Grandelius and now Vidit. Uh, so Vidit's still on 5.5 out of 10. At the top, Magnus Carlsen with 7 out of 10. He drew very quickly against Karyakin today. And in second place, Anish Giri with 6.5. So three rounds to go. It's still actually wide open. I think Giri has a slightly easier run-in. He plays Rapport and Van Forest and then Grandelius. And let me see, Carlson has to play Vidit, Caruana, and Dubov. So 
Geary is very much in contention, even though he's half a point behind Magnus Carlsen. So it's a rest day tomorrow. Thursday is a rest day in, in uh, Vikanze. And they resume with round 11 on Friday. See you then.